Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart Podcast. In today's episode, it's going to be a solo episode. I'm going to be talking about skin health, and I'm also going to be talking about light. So I've kind of broken things up into a few different categories here. And so uh, first, I'm going to talk about how to treat bags under the eyes. I'm going to talk about some other topical treatments that can aid in skin health. I'm going to talk about oral treatments regarding skin health. And then I'm going to get into a little bit of the Medispa stuff. So I'm going to be talking about microneedling and also vampire facelifts. Uh, and then lastly, I do want to talk about how you can protect yourself from the sun uh, with things that you can actually ingest orally. And finally, I'm going to finish off with light and a little bit about saunas. So let's get into the first question, the first topic. You know, how do you treat bags under the eyes? So, you know, puffiness or bags under the eyes is something that a lot of people uh, you know, find to be very annoying and find to be very embarrassing. You know, they want it fixed just because it can, you know, cause a little bit of uh, self-consciousness, uh, you know, maybe lower their confidence because, you know, they don't feel that um, their bags on the eyes are very attractive. And so, you know, one way that you can uh, reduce the that feature or the bags under the eyes is by using topical caffeine. So topical caffeine is a vasoconstrictor. And so when you have the puffiness or the bags here, you have a lot of fluid. And when you put the topical caffeine right on, then what happens is you cause vasoconstriction. So you constrict the blood vessels around that area. And then as a consequence, there'll be less fluid in that area. So, you know, people do report, um, you know, that by using topical caffeine, they do see good results, generally even within days to weeks. Uh, so, you know, excellent uh, over-the-counter um, treatment for bags under the eyes. Um, regarding, though, the, uh, the percentage that you want to uh, use, so the studies show that you can use 1% to 3% very effectively, and that can be helpful for uh, reducing the appearance of bags on the eyes, but you can actually go all the way up to 5%. Going beyond that, uh, we don't really know, and it's likely that you may see diminishing returns. And so what I would suggest is to you know start off on the lower end, say start off with 1%, and then build yourself up from there. And if you see benefit with 1%, hey, maybe you'll see more benefit with 3%. Go for it. If you think you're still seeing benefit with 3%, Go up to five percent, and you know, see if that helps. So that would be my overall approach. Um, and if you do want to, you know, look up some studies, I will be linking uh, some notes to that uh, in the podcast. And there was study done in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology that found that caffeine-based treatments significantly reduce periorbital, so that's this area just under the eye puffiness after regular usage and these were just with over-the-counter serums you know they weren't compounded at a at a compound pharmacist so again you know really easy treatment uh, for treating bags under the eyes and you will we'll see pretty immediate results so like i said i'm also going to be talking about other topical treatments that you can use to improve your overall skin health and the one that usually comes up a lot that most people uh, certainly know about or seems to be most prominent to include it in most products is vitamin C. So what does vitamin C do? Well, vitamin C can increase collagen absorption. And that's why you'll see a lot of collagen products also have vitamin C in it because obviously they work synergistically together. And one thing about that too is that you know, you do need obviously oral vitamin C in addition to topical vitamin C and you, but you don't necessarily need to purchase extra vitamin C if you're already getting a collagen supplement, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, because like I said, most collagen supplements do have vitamin C in it. But coming back to topical vitamin C, so topical vitamin C can reduce wrinkles, can reduce fine lines. Um, and in addition to that, it has some uh, a major effect actually on photo aging or reducing the uh, sun uh, damage. So um, again, when you're talking about these different topical products, you always want to look at the percentage because uh, you know the percentage is going to make a big difference. There's products with you know five percent vitamin C, there's ten percent, there's twenty percent. 
So, you know, 10% vitamin C is, is plenty enough to reduce fine lines, to reduce wrinkles. Um, if you want to reduce uh, photo aging, and a photo aging again is sun damage, uh, if you want to reduce that, then you may want to go up to about 20%. Uh, and just note too that some products may not say vitamin C, they may label it as ascorbic acid. So, ascorbic acid and vitamin C are the same thing. So, if you see a product, uh, that has ascorbic acid, understand that's vitamin C. So look for products that are, you know, more uh, up into the 20% range if you're looking to reduce uh, photo aging. If you're not looking to reduce photo aging, you know, 10% products may be uh, sufficient uh, just for reducing fine lines and wrinkles. And so there is a third uh, topical treatment that I want to get into uh, besides the caffeine and vitamin C, which we've already discussed, and that's hyaluronic acid. And I, hyaluronic acid can also be taken orally, which I will be discussing uh, just in a moment. So for right now, I'm just going to stick to talking about topical hyaluronic acid. So again, this comes in various concentrations, um, maybe almost the most variable because there's studies that show that even 0.1% of topical hyaluronic acid can actually improve skin hydration and elasticity. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty incredible that just such a low dose of something can improve uh, overall skin health. And, you know, the reason being because some people can be sensitive to certain products, which I'll talk about as well. And so, you know, that's why I always, you know, suggest that people use the lowest effective concentration first. You don't want to go so low where, um, you know, you're not even going to get any benefit. So, you know, definitely start off at 0.1% with hyaluronic acid. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't just jump into 1% or 2%, you know, right away. I would just, you know, introduce 0.1%, see how you do with that, and then go from there. Again, I am going to be linking uh, some studies about this in the show notes, but a clinical trial published in Dermatology and Therapy found that 0.1% hyaluronic acid solution significantly increase skin hydration and reduce the appearance of wrinkles. So, you know, again, the low concentrations do work. But what do the higher concentrations of hyaluronic acid offer? So products that are in the 1% to 2% range offer more intensive hydration, uh, particularly for mature skin or older skin. So uh, when, when we have uh, older patients, you know, sometimes they use what many people call the plumpness of their skin, for lack of a better word. That's generally the term that I hear um, you know, a lot of dermatologists use as well. Um, they find that they lose that when they're, when they're older. And by using a higher concentration of hyaluronic acid, like one or 2%, they may be able to restore or give the appearance of that plumpness again that uh, so many people desire. So, um, you know, definitely different uses at uh, different concentrations, um, but certainly yeah, overall, you know, a wonderful uh, product, been well researched and can definitely improve the overall uh, skin health and skin hydration. Um, I am going to get into one other topical treatment. Uh, now, this topical treatment I uh, left for last because it is only available by prescription, unfortunately, and that is Retin A. So Retin A, you know, this can uh, improve the appearance of photo aging, uh, also regarding wrinkles, mottled hyperpigmentation, uh, shallowness. Uh, really can improve overall skin appearance and skin health. Um, but I will say that, you know, I have had patients, have had friends that have reacted poorly to Retin-A. And so, you know, it's definitely not for everyone. Um, so you definitely want to try the lowest dose first, you know, even, you know, more significantly with uh, the Retin-A compared to the other uh, products, just because the uh, the consequences of the side effects may be a little bit worse with Retin-A, say, compared to, say, uh, vitamin C or, uh, or hyaluronic acid. So uh, because of that, um, definitely start with the lowest concentration. The lowest concentration is usually around 0.01%, uh, so very low concentration. Um, you know, and some people use up to, say, like 0.25%, which is um, you know, almost like 20, well, it's 25 times stronger. So you definitely want to start off with the lower end of that. And so 
the next question for you know many people becomes you know can you combine all these yes you absolutely can combine all of them and you probably will get you know the best results by using all of them instead of just one that being said I would never introduce more than one product at a time, whether it's you know topical, whether it's uh, oral supplementation, whatever it is, I would just never do it. And so uh, for that reason, you know, I do recommend introducing one of these products at a time. But if you introduce one product and everything is great, and then say after a few weeks, you introduce another product uh, and everything is great, then you can just keep doing that. And eventually, you know, you may get to a point where you've tried, you know, all uh, four products and, you know, there's no... Um, uh, side effects from from either of, of them or any of them and because of that uh, you know you will get more results or better results by using all of them together because they will work uh, additively or synergistically so um, that kind of completes most of the uh, discussion that I had on on uh, topical treatments so I will move on to oral treatments so there are ways in which we can improve our skin health by ingesting oral products and so one of the ones I already mentioned uh, topically, and that is hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid can significantly improve skin hydration even after two to eight weeks, and it can improve skin tone, and it can actually increase your epidermal thickness, so the thickness of your skin. And so, and the epidermal thickness, I should note, in that study was after 12 weeks. Uh, the skin hydration was after two to eight weeks. And so the dose used was around 100 milligrams. Um, you know, I've seen 200 milligrams used as well and, get, and people have had fantastic results as that. Um, hyaluronic acid is also really interesting because it has a very positive effect on joints, on joint health. So a lot of people use hyaluronic acid uh, just for uh, improving their overall joint health and they find that that's incredibly effective. So, um, you know, if you have, if you want to improve your skin health and if you want to improve your joint health, you know, hyaluronic acid is a good option for that. So um, hyaluronic acid was number one on the oral list. Number two is collagen. So you may have heard about collagen before, and I've already you know, brought it up a few times in this podcast. Um, so oral supplementation of collagen does seem to improve skin hydration and skin elasticity. So how much should you use? So about 15 to 30 grams. So that is quite a bit of, of collagen. Um, it certainly is on the higher end, when, especially when you're going to the 30 grams. I think you would do fine just with 15 grams. And that's where I would start, especially too, because it can become a little bit more expensive uh, once you get in up into the 30 gram range. And then we should talk about, you know, what types of collagen are best for skin. And so there's several different types. We have type 1, type 2, type 3, type 5, type 10. It's generally type 1 and type 3 that have been most researched for skin. Uh, type 2 is best for joint health. Uh, it seems to also, unfortunately, be the most expensive one. Uh, but 1 and 3 are generally the ones that are used in powders. Uh, and they tend to be a little bit less expensive than type 2. Um, I do want to make a note, though, on collagen because some people will see the protein content of collagen and then they will count this towards their total protein intake for the day. However, you don't want to do this. Uh, the reason being is because the protein quality in collagen is not high. So even though I take 15 grams of collagen a day, I don't count that towards my total daily protein intake because it's really low in branched chain amino acids. It's an incomplete protein and it's just not good for overall building muscle or maintaining muscle. And so for that reason, uh, you know, I don't recommend that you uh, include or, or sorry, count your collagen protein towards your total daily protein intake. Um, and then, as I said before, make sure that you're taking some vitamin C with your collagen because that is going to increase the absorption. Uh, and, but also remember, most collagen products out there already have vitamin C in it. So you don't need to necessarily purchase a vitamin C supplement uh, on its own. Generally, if you're going to be supplementing with collagen, there's vitamin C in it already. So I have one more thing on the oral list, and that is niacinamide. 
So niacinamide is vitamin B3. Uh, you may have heard of that before. And this really seems to treat almost every condition on earth. Um, here's a direct quote from a peer-reviewed article that I want to share with you. Niacinamide has been verified in treating almost every skin disorder. Aging, hyperpigmentation, acne, psoriasis, pruritus, dermatitis, fungal infections, epidermal melasma, non-melanoma skin cancer, etc. So literally almost every skin condition that you can name will, would benefit from niacinamide supplementation. And they usually use about 500 milligrams two times a day. Um, regarding niacinamide though, I do want to make one quick note. Uh, this is regarding the cardiovascular effects. So it's been well known, you know, I even learned this in medical school that niacin can improve uh, overall cholesterol, uh, you know, reduce um, the effects of, uh, or sorry, reduce LDL, uh, boost HDL. You know, it seems to have all these, you know, pretty incredible properties for cardiovascular health. However, um, there was a study or something that came out earlier this year that indicated that the metabolites from niacinamide may in fact um, be uh, uh, poor for cardiovascular health and may be toxic for cardiovascular health. And so because of that, I just want to have a little bit of a caution out there. Um, like the research that I've seen on this overall is that by taking niacin, there seems to be a neutral effect. And I'm just making a, a hypothesis here, but I imagine that, you know, the beneficial effect comes from the lipids and then the negative effect comes from that metabolite that uh, I was just discussing. And because of that, uh, there's, there may be a little bit of a washout um, and we have this neutral effect overall. You know, I'm not sure overall though, uh, you know, if that is, uh, you know, accurate. It's just sort of a hypothesis of mine. I don't know if anyone can say definitively, you know, what the you know overall effect of niacinamide is on cardiovascular disease. But I just wanted to point that out there, give you guys all the information, and you can make your own, you know, informed decision about it. Um, I am still sort of on the fence about niacinamide. I do want to know, you know, more about this metabolite and if it is damaging to our cardiovascular system. Um, so that more or less uh, completes the general uh, oral supplementation that I want to talk about, but I'm not completely done yet with oral supplementation. And the reason being is because, you know, we've talked about the sun a little bit and, you know, it's, it's said that about 80% of skin damage comes from photo aging, comes from the sun. And so if we really want to, you know, reduce fine lines, reduce uh, wrinkles, you know, reduce the appearance of aging of our skin. And what we want to do is reduce the damage from the sun. You know, if 80% of the damage is coming from the sun, then we really need to focus on reducing, um, you know, all the damage that comes from it. And so that's when I, what I get into now. Uh, so there's two different products that I want to talk about. One of them is called Fern Block, which is also called Polypodium Leucomotus. And the, I think I'm saying that right. And the other one is called asaxanthin. Again, difficult to pronounce. Uh, that is the red or the pink pigment that's found in fish, like salmon. So uh, I'm going to chat a little bit about both. So I'll start with the first one called fern block. So fern block has antioxidant activity. So it increases the activity of something called the NRF2 pathway. And that's going to regulate the expression of antioxidant proteins, which reduce inflammation and damage caused by UV exposure. So the antioxidant activity found within that particular product, uh, firm block, or again, polypillium leucotomos, uh, is going to reduce uh, damage caused by UV exposure. It also has anti-inflammatory effects. So it's going to reduce markers, like you may have heard of before, like TNF-alpha or COX-2. So it'll reduce these markers, which are typically elevated after being out in the sun or after UV exposure. And this is going to reduce sunburn and the long-term risks of photoaging and, of course, skin cancer. So all these things, uh, you know, together, um, you know, working within one molecule, and I'm not even done yet. 
Uh, so the last one is, you know, it does protect you from DNA. And so we know that UV rays can induce mutations leading to cancer. And so by protecting our DNA and by reducing or lowering the risk of those UV mutations, we can potentially reduce the rate of photo aging and also other forms of cancer. So a great thing to use before you get into the sun. Uh, and the second one is the exanathin. Like I said, that's that pink or red pigment that's usually found in salmon. So uh, exanathin has a couple different ways where it can uh, help our skin health, particularly in the sun. So one of them, again, is that it can prevent UV-induced cell damage. So this is going to uh, preserve collagen, and it's also going to prevent the breakdown of the skin structures that leads to uh, wrinkles and photoaging. So uh, by using exanathin, again, you're going to maintain the collagen that is generally degraded from UV or sun exposure, and you're going to maintain that skin elasticity. And overall, you know, if you use both of these products together, you know, you're really going to have a really good uh, team working together in reducing your overall damage from the sun. Um, I do want to say, however, this is far from like a full discussion on how to protect yourself from the sun. You know, I haven't talked about sunscreen. I haven't talked about just general skin barriers. Uh, so this is not a complete um, uh, discussion on how to protect yourself from the sun. But there are two different oral products that are helpful for reducing skin damage and photo aging from the sun. And I do think that uh, those can be very effective if you use those together, especially consistently if you're going to be out in the sun. So uh, now I am complete my discussion with oral treatments. Um, but so I'm going to move on to actually a couple medi spa treatments. So a lot of people have you know asked about micro needling in particular. Um, that one comes up a lot, and micro needling you know is used for various different things, like such as regrowing hair. Even there, there's some you know some evidence for it there. Um, I'll you know we'll get into that on, on maybe a different podcast. Uh, I may do on hair loss, but micro needling. So you know what is that exactly? It's also known as collagen induction therapy. And basically, they're just using, you know, very, very fine needles that are poking into you uh, that create these micro injuries in the skin. And they more or less stimulate the body's natural healing uh, process. And so what does that look like? Well, it looks like the production of collagen and elastin. So we know that, you know, increasing collagen production is fantastic for our overall skin health and skin appearance. And so by doing uh, a little bit of micro needling, we can in fact boost overall collagen production, which will help again with skin health and skin appearance. But it also has some more therapeutic uh, applications, I would like to say. And that would be the improvement of acne scars. So, you know, acne scars are horrible uh, for some people. You know, it can really cause, uh, you know, social anxiety, even, uh, you know, low confidence because, you know, they know the scars are there. They're afraid people are looking at them. And so by, you know, improving someone's acne scars, you really can, you know, change someone's life and, and really change their overall mental health, which I sometimes think is um you know, not uh, talked about enough. Um, but getting back to uh, the micro needling, so it can help with uh, acne scars and, you know, how long and how often do you have to do it? So usually even just three sessions, you know, studies have shown just three sessions of micro needling can in fact reduce acne scars or improve them. And the sessions are usually done about four to six weeks apart. So just keep that in mind. So about three sessions of microneedling can dramatically improve acne scars. Um, and again, you know, getting back to the procedure itself, it usually doesn't uh, cause too much like redness and swelling. Yes, you will have it for a few days, but usually after that, it goes away. Um, in addition to, you know, treating acne scars, you know, we've talked obviously a lot about topical treatments today. And so when you are using a micro needle, you're creating those little tiny, uh, those, those little tiny indents, you know, that is actually going to improve the absorption rate of the topical things that you're going to use. So things like vitamin C or hyaluronic acid that we talked about. So by using the micro needling and combining them with those treatments, then you kind of get the best of both worlds by increasing the overall absorption. Um, so lots of different applications for micro needling and something that will probably only become more you know, popular in the future uh, as far as I can see. Um, 
So next, I'm going to move on to another Medispa treatment. And this is Tim Ferriss's favorite, or at least I saw a picture on Tim uh, saying he gets a vampire facelift every year. I think he's been doing it for like eight to 10 years. Uh, he seems to think that they're you know quite effective. And the research, in fact, would you know indicate that. So, so Tim's right about that. Um, so, you know, the vampire face. So what is that exactly? So again, uh, this is something that's non-surgical, just like micro needling. You don't have to be put under, you know, it's just a small, uh, fairly non-invasive procedure. And so what that involves and what is PRP was well, platelet rich plasma. And so essentially uh, the process here is that uh, they'll get your own blood and then they will uh, get the, they'll spin it in a centrifuge, uh, they'll get the platelet rich plasma, and then they will inject that back into you. So that's sort of, you know, the, the bare bones of, uh, or the, the Cliff Notes version of how it works. And so uh, the PRP contains certain growth factors, and these growth factors stimulate collagen production, and they improve skin texture, and just accelerate the skin's healing and overall rejuvenation, uh, rejuvenation process. Um, people report improved skin texture. Again, that's largely through the increased collagen, uh, collagen production, which helps to improve skin firmness, smooth fine lines, reduce wrinkles. And also the growth factors in PRP are going to enhance skin regeneration and enhance the overall tone and glow of the skin. So, uh, you know, two different Medispa uh, procedures uh, that definitely uh, are effective when you combine the two of them and certainly effective on their own as well uh, you know people are always looking for you know different ways to improve their overall skin health you know to uh, reduce the appearance of, of aging in general and again these are two fairly well researched uh, medispa procedures uh, that do in fact have quite a bit of peer-reviewed research behind them so that more or less uh, concludes what i want to chat about today regarding skin um, in some ways, because I want to move on to light. Now, obviously, you know, within the light spectrum, you know, skin health does come up there quite a bit, uh, which I will get into. But in terms of light itself, what I really want to talk about is red light. So, you know, what is red light therapy? What are the differences between red light, near infrared light, mid infrared light, and far infrared light? You know, uh, it can be very confusing overall. So let's just kind of get into uh, the differences between uh, those different types of light. So red light is visible light that you can see. Uh, the wavelength is about 620 to 750 nanometers, and it usually penetrates about one to three millimeters into the skin. And so this is good because it affects the superficial layers of the, of the skin, which simulates collagen production. I know I keep talking about collagen, but it stimulates collagen production, reduces inflammation, uh, promotes wound healing. So there's lots of different uses for uh, just red light. Now I'm going to get into near infrared light in a second, but this is just the red light that you can actually visibly see. And before I talk about near infrared light, I just want to make a comment on something called photobiomodulation. So when people say red light or red light therapy, in general, not all the time, but in general, what they're referring to is red light between 700 to 1,000 nanometers, and that would include red light and near infrared light. And what those panels are that you usually see, it usually has one at around 660 nanometers, which would be the red light, and then about 860 meters, somewhere around there for the near infrared light, and they combine them together, and that's what's called photobiomodulation or red light therapy. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I know this whole red light thing can be confusing, and hopefully at the end of this, uh, you won't be confused. Um, so again, the red light, uh, you know, 600 to uh, 20 to 750 nanometers, penetrates one to three millimeters, really good for superficial uh, skin areas, um, like, uh, and can help with uh, wound healing, reducing inflammation, and can even help with conditions like acne and rosacea. So people will report 
you know, using red light therapy for about six to eight weeks. And with that, they'll see pretty dramatic improvements overall in, in acne and rosacea. Um, you know, I've even had patients that have told me that. And so, you know, I'm not saying that it's the only thing that's going to fix your acne or rosacea, but it is uh, something that you can try. And like I said, there is some evidence out there that indicates that it can be effective for those conditions. Um, so let's get into near infrared light. So near infrared light, some people consider it to be the most important one, which I'll talk about in a second. Near infrared light, uh, the wavelength is about 750 nanometers to 1500 nanometers. And again, the therapeutic range is usually 800 to 1000. That's within the photo biomodulation, 700 to um to 1,000 nanometers or 600 to 1,000 nanometers is usually what we use for photobiomodulation. And so uh, near infrared light is uh, the one that penetrates actually the deepest. So that can go up to about five to 10 millimeters. And because of that, it does provide some different properties than red light. So it reaches the muscles and joints and deeper tissues, and it can, pre it can promote cellular regeneration and improve circulation and reduce inflammation. So there's a lot of different therapeutic effects that uh, near infrared light has, but perhaps the biggest that I haven't noticed, and this is the one why people think this is maybe the most effective one out of the four that I've mentioned, is that because once it gets into the mitochondria, it generates ATP and that gives us energy. And so because it penetrates so deeply and it gets into the mitochondria and it generates uh, ATP and gives us energy, you know, people, you know, kind of gravitate towards this one a little bit out of all of them because most people just want more energy. Um, but I will say that red light can also reach the mitochondria and it can also boost energy, but it just doesn't do it as much as near infrared light. Of course, once they get inside the cell and they have the same effect, you know, produces the same effect, but you'll get more um, more activity overall from the near infrared light than from the red light because it penetrates deeper. So uh, just one important um, point that I wanted to make there. And again, this is really effective for um, improving inflammation, reducing inflammation in joints and muscles and improving overall recovery. So near infrared light is something that you know a lot of people are using now and getting into uh, for various different reasons, but a lot of it seems to do with skin health, pain relief, um, and also just general uh, anti-aging effects and the energy production, of course, like I mentioned. And so before I move on to mid-infrared light, I just want to make a point that red light and near-infrared light are generally grouped together. Like I said, those are the ones that are usually used in um, those red light panels and then mid infrared light and far infrared light that they rely more on heat therapy just on like generating heat in your body and i'm going to get into that now in a second so mid infrared light uh, the wavelength is about 1500 to 3000 nanometers it penetrates only about 0 0.5 to 3 millimeters into the skin so it's not too too deep um but roughly the same as, as, as red light. And so what this does is it really increases the heat in your body. Um, you know, this is commonly used in saunas and generally, you know, it makes the, it makes you heat up extremely quickly, um, which is, again, is great for people who want to use mid infrared light in a sauna. And that can generate a lot of blood flow, which can improve overall circulation. And people do report uh, less pain when using the uh, mid infrared light. And there have been studies that show that it can actually reduce low back pain, which is you know, pretty incredible. Um, so mid infrared light, again, you know, most of you are relying on the heat that it promotes and the heating effects. Uh, and I'm going to, to get into heat shock proteins at the end after I get into far infrared light. And so far infrared light is also used in saunas. That's what I have. I have a far infrared light sauna. Uh, it, the wavelength is about 3000 nanometers to one millimeter. The penetration depth of far infrared light is actually just at the surface. So it's only about 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 millimeters. And 
it's less penetrating deeply into the body and it just generates heat at the surface level. So when you get the far infrared light, it's kind of like you're cooking the outside of your body. When you're getting the mid infrared light, it's almost like you're cooking the inside of your body. So you're cooking yourself from the inside and the outside. And so they work really, really well together for heating up your body. And again, it's going to have a lot of the same effects as mid infrared light because it's mostly relying upon heat. And so uh, people will report, you know, just from the heat that they feel much more relaxed. You know, a lot of people enjoy the, 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 uh, the idea and the thought of sweating. Um, and also, too, uh, it can just provide some mild pain relief and mild uh, relief to muscle tension, uh, especially when you combine it again with the mid-infrared light and you generate that body heat. And both of these together, you know, they kind of uh, mimic almost like uh, a low cardiovascular exercise response because you will get increased heart rate, uh, you will get blood flow, uh, you will get dilated blood vessels. And so it's really good for our, circular, for our circulatory system, really good for our cardiovascular system. Uh, and can be, you know, incredible for just overall relaxation and sometimes just mental health. You know, a lot of people find that their sauna is just kind of uh, the thing that they, you know, really look forward to to doing during, you know, what part of the day that, that it is. For me, it's always after a workout, uh, but it can definitely be something that, you know, can almost become uh, addicting because the feeling of getting into the sauna and and that high that you get with it uh, can become very. Um, you know, intoxicating to some degree. Um, on that note, obviously, be very, very careful when you're on the sauna. Don't go in for too long. Uh, you know, don't get too hot to a point where you feel like you're going to pass out. You know, make sure that you do get out of the sauna when you do feel like that. And so when we generate a lot of heat, like we can when we use a mid-infrared sauna or far infrared sauna, you know, how does that induce heat shock proteins? And what are heat shock proteins? And, you know, what are they doing? Why are they so beneficial? Why do you hear, you know, Dr. Andrew Hooverman or Dr. Rhonda Patrick or Joe Rogan talking about these? And so heat shock proteins are a family of proteins that are critical in protecting our cells from stress and, and for promoting overall cellular health. So there's a few different things that heat shock proteins do. But before I get into that, I do want to talk about the criteria for like, how do you know that you are inducing heat shock proteins? Say you get into your mid or far infrared sauna and your, your body temperature is going up. Like, how do you know that you're getting heat shock proteins or producing heat shock proteins? So there seems to be two different um, things that we can measure. But again, this definition is very hazy. It's not really teased out in the literature. But raising your body temperature by somewhere between 1 to 3 degrees Celsius, I know that's a big range, but by 1 to 3 degrees Celsius, we can induce heat shock proteins. And then also to combine that with some type of water loss seems to be uh, helpful as well. I think there's less literature on the water loss, more in the raising of your own body temperature. So probably focus on that one if you're you know, just focusing on one. And it's likely that you'll induce more heat shock protein, say, at raising your body temperature two and three degrees than, say, just at one degree. But obviously... Like I said before, you want to be really, really careful. As soon as you feel like you're dizzy in the sauna, you know, get out because it's a dangerous place to be uh, if you do you know, fall asleep in there. You definitely don't want that to happen. And so just coming back to the heat shock proteins. So there's a lot of different uh, applications that they have uh, in terms of improving our overall health. Um, one thing is that it can enhance muscle recovery from exercise. So people report that, you know, after using the sauna, inducing heat shock proteins, you know, that's one of the potential mechanisms by which uh, they can recover a little bit quicker. Um, also, too, it's been shown uh, that can help with uh, neural protection. So it potentially may be an effective way to uh, stave off Alzheimer's disease. So heat shock proteins, you know, very, very uh, neuroprotective, uh, also help with muscle recovery, like I mentioned. And then in addition to that, uh, they can really help with just promoting longevity and aging. So there's been um, studies that have shown that, you know, overexpression of heat shock proteins can actually lead to uh, extended lifespan. And these are in model organisms, you know, they are not in, in humans, so we don't know for sure, but, um, you know, very interesting research. So 
We know that, you know, again, there's lots of benefit from uh, heat in the sauna. And also we know, we've identified that heat shock proteins themselves do have specific benefits, do have specific benefits. So like I said, uh, I am going, to, I was going to mention, um, you know, how I use the sauna and how I, uh, you know, combine all the treatments together. And so I have a far infrared sauna. And then what I do is I got a four, um, piece sauna space, uh, bulb set from sauna space. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. Yes. I had him, uh, the CEO on my podcast, but, uh, we don't exchange anything. I'm not affiliated with them. No partnership whatsoever. Um, so those particular bulbs put out red light, near infrared light, mid infrared light and far infrared light. So I'm getting a double dose of the far infrared light. And I can just tell you that my body heats up extremely quickly. If I've put my you know body temperature up there by like two and a half degrees Celsius in just uh, like 18 to, to 22 minutes in that time range, you know, before now I was getting in the far infrared sun, unfortunately I wasn't measuring my temperature at that point, but I'd need to get in there for at least 30 minutes. Now I can only handle about 18 to 22. And, you know, by doing that, I'm getting all four uh, red light benefits. Uh, so again, the red light and then the near med and far, and then I'm also getting, you know, the heat therapy, right? So the heat shock proteins from all that uh, heat that I'm getting. And so that's the way I use the sauna. And, you know, again, you use it how you want to, but uh, that's the way I use it. I've gotten, you know, fantastic results doing it. I really enjoy it. So um, thank you so much, guys, for listening to this podcast. You know, hopefully you, you know, learned a little bit about skin health, learned a little bit about light and saunas. And as always, I'll be back again soon.